Okay, <clears throat> so this session is in the community track at ApacheCon. Uh, my name is Shane Kirkrew. I uh, started a consulting company to help tell people about how open source really works called Ponder Things. And we're gonna explore who pays for FOSS foundations, for who pays for open source sort of behind the scenes and how do organizations like the Apache Software Foundation get their funding. So what does that actually mean? Who pays for open source foundations? Now we don't pay for open source. We can just use it for free. This talk is really about all of the ways that open source, both projects and products and communities actually build the software, right? So the, the ways we might pay to build it that we want to. Um, but we should really have some more definitions. So I wanna quickly cover um, what, what is open source. I hope we all know that just to be clear. How do you pay for it? Or rather the different ways we, we can contribute to making projects work, um, whether it's code or services or testing or documentation, yay, documentation. Uh, and then we'll go into the interesting part of uh, how some major foundations actually get funded and what their funding levels are and where it comes from. So what does open source mean? So just to be clear, open source is software code that's publicly available that is under an OSI approved license under the OSD, their definition is here. Okay, hopefully we all understand that here in ApacheCon. And we also understand in Apache that that's not really the important part of a project. It's great, it's an open source license, but who is managing the project? How do they manage new cont contributions? Do they welcome new contributions from anyone? Um, how do they get other support? Do they have infrastructure for builds, things like that? When you're a small independent open source project, you might be able to run out of your garage, but when you get to a bigger scale, you need support of a foundation or of someone to help with all the other things besides just writing code. So what does that mean? And who are we talking about? Um, because this is, when I talk to different people about this kind of talk, they have totally different viewpoints, whether they're thinking as a corporate employee or vice president of finance or just a user who's curious about this. Well, let's break it down a little bit in terms of individuals versus organizations. So we all as users can contribute work by doing testing or submitting bugs. We have lots of contributors at Apache who we love who actually submit the fixes or maybe make a new documentation in a different language. And of course, committers and maintainers or PMC members who are the individuals working on a project. And we know who they are because they're all people like us. What is a different way to look at it is organizations can contribute work or funding. So commercial companies is of course a big topic that we always think about and we are like, who's behind which project? Uh, governments in Europe in particular, as opposed to the US, um, there are plenty of uh, grants for different open source related projects, whether it's to a project directly or to a company that's working on a project. And of course, all everybody in, everyone in research and academia, uh, we actually have another talk coming up after this of an experience of someone from an academic background, but who's really embracing open source. So that'll be interesting to see too. So a good question is, uh, who does the most work in open source projects? Well, we'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. So this is a different, this is a way of looking at the things we do, not necessarily who it is, but what we do, whether we put in effort, which is, we're all familiar with that, whether we're putting in pull requests or we're providing support on a mailing list, right? That's super helpful for project committers if other users can help other users answer their questions or, or make them better. Um, or creating a new project that you wanna to bring to a foundation or you wanna to bring to the next level. And of course, on the other side, we have funding, right? This is rarely coming from individuals, mostly from corporations, sometimes from governments, um, whether it's sponsoring a foundation or project, helping run events, because those are really hard to run without some sort of infrastructure and money behind them, um, providing cloud, cloud hosting and so on. And the big one, which is the bottom here, is paying employees to do work. So these are all different ways that someone can help pay to build open source, um, whether or not it's directly money. And money keeps coming up in a lot of different topics. And my theory is that um, the money is not as important as the community, certainly. Um, the contributions themselves are what's important to the projects. But on a bigger scale, 
um, the way those com contributions come to us are most often from corporations. So all of the funding for the services and so on, uh, that kind of obscures the fact that many of our committers at Apache and other organizations uh, are actually just paid open source, I mean, paid developers at software vendors or non-software vendors in a lot of cases, um, where effectively the company is, is bankrolling most of their work. Uh, so let's actually look at some data instead of just listening to me uh, opine about these ideas. So where does open source come from? Well, the Linux kernel development um, has a long history and they have tracked which companies are sponsoring work. So they've tracked every single commit and then they can, in that small enough realm, they can see who works for what company during what year mm -hmm. uh, and then track what is done as essentially a, an employee and what is done as a volunteer. Well, in 2018, 85% of all code in the Linux kernel was paid corporate work. That is, they're almost sure that it's directly as some company investing by having their employee do the work. And if we look back in history, uh, that's been a pretty steady, slow and steady increase from 2010, it was 70%. Um, as Linux scales, it's sort of hard to get into doing the development if, unless you have the experience and the time to do it. So that's a huge factor of what actually drives Linux kernel development. If we look at Apache, back in 2016, we did a survey that had a very clear question. How, what time are you spending contributing code to your projects at Apache? And at the time, about 50% replied that it was an, as an employee, as their job. So half of all commit, Apache committers um, were doing their work as a job. Uh, we've done another survey recently, which has a slightly different question, but the numbers are similar. About half is done as directly paid work. Um, and of course the other half may be paid by a consultant or maybe um, part during their day and part during the evening. We're not quite sure, uh, but there's a clear trend here. And if we go, go over to Drupal, Drupal has a great system in their commit logs where there's a thing called the credit system um, where you can note why you were making a code fix or a documentation update or adding a new module. So over in Drupal back in 2019, and they do this every year, which is great, 65% uh, of their code that was committed in 2019 was wholly sponsored work. That means the person who was actually doing the work, that the individual said that they were either paid by their employer as a software vendor, or in Drupal's case, a lot of system integrators um, or uh, agency models hire contractors to do work for specific clients. Um, but again, this is a pretty um, clear recognition that all of the major open source projects we all use, the bulk of the code is done by companies having their employees do the work, which is something that's kind of a little bit hidden. And again, if we look back, not just at what code we're using now, but what new code is gonna come out, well, where do widely used open source projects come from? Um, certainly there are some passionate hobbyists and some of them, especially in older times, have become the big thing. Um, certainly in academic and research projects, Apache has uh, at least half a dozen academic or um, that sort of thing, projects that have come around uh, geospatial and some math related projects and science related projects, which really have done great stuff from coming from just academia to a bigger world. Um, a lot of new projects come from vendor groups where one company will get a couple other companies together, launch something up, and of course, we always have single companies coming and saying, hey, we want to open source our project. Well, the answer is all of the above, right? The software we use today of the major projects, you look through them, you could find a couple of examples from each of these categories just in the things that you're working on as, as a developer, at least. As an end user, may not, you may not realize where they come from. But I would say that mostly um, they were companies. Uh, a lot of these open source projects we rely on came from corporate vendors in the past, uh, because whether it came as an idea from one engineer in the corporation and then became a project of theirs and then became open sourced, or whether the corporation said, we have a proprietary product, okay, we wanna open source it for some business reason. Um, to get to scale, in a lot of cases, you need a company support. Um, so that's another important aspect of how do projects get built is in a lot of cases, companies make the, the effort to start with, whether directly or through their employees, to then bring it to the open source realm where we can have a community like at Apache or other foundations work on it. So what do you think about that? 
um, in terms of, did you realize how much of obviously marketing and, and press releases from companies, it's obvious when a new project gets donated because they want you to know about it. But did everybody realize how much of the work from the committers around us on the list are done because they're full-time employees and, and their manager told them to do the work, which is fine, but their company is driving that. Um, that's an important part of how open source gets built. And it's something that we don't often, it's not always obvious when we're following a project along how that works. And some of the difficulty here is um, when you're a project contributor, you you know the other people on the list whose code review you're you're doing or whose pull requests you're looking at. Um, you know those people, and sometimes you know who they work for, but there are a lot of ways that are either direct contributions or there are a lot of ways that are indirect contributions. And the backing, the financial backing behind these isn't always obvious to the rest of the community. So of course, direct contributions, whether it's code, which is what we do, or documentation, um, cloud credits and services, things that you work use day to day, uh, a lot of those are donated by companies, uh, either to a foundation or you know, just as a, as a company effort saying, any committer on this project can use our service for free as long as you're using this, pro this, this, this project. Um, and of course, direct contributions, whether it's a, an individual not being paid or an employee being paid. Indirect contributions, uh, again, this is big in Drupal, where uh, companies will hire consultants, whether it's a, a consulting firm or whether it's an agency model, where um, Drupal actually has a category for some major non-technology companies that work with major agencies that are Drupal experts. And they track that both to the agency and to the the funder, the company who is asking for some new feature, which is great on their side. And of course, funding. So whether it's sponsoring a foundation or a project directly, or whether it's sponsoring an event, like when we're here at ApacheCon at home, make sure to go over to the expo booth and check out our, our uh, sponsors there who help make sure that they can pay for the event. We don't have, sorry, we don't have snacks. I've got my coffee, you'll have to get your own drinks. Um, but paying for the, the hop-in service and paying for the rest of the work around a conference still takes money in a lot of cases to do it at scale. And those are important ways that um, it's kind of obvious at the conference because you see the big signs usually when we're in person, but thinking about all the things that that funding lets our conference organizers do is something we often don't consider. And that's a really important factor for when we're actually trying to run a conference with someone like Sharon or Rich or Brian who've been doing this one. Um, that's a huge help that the changes how a foundation or a project can actually be able to do things. Well, I've been talking about FOSS foundations, um, which can be in an independent home. That's what Apache looks to be. Um, because for an independent small project, it's a regular struggle, both trying to attract contributors to make sure your build pipeline is still running. If you're, you know, if your machine goes down, you need to use cloud credits, um, finding ways to draw new contributors or even just look at old bugs to make sure that they're you know being kept active. So one important thing is that foundations can serve as um, both a gathering point, a way to sort of get your word out there, as well as a bunch of other support services that can help your project out. So what are some of the services that foundations can provide? Uh, hopefully a lot of this is obvious for people who are familiar with Apache Software Foundation projects because we already have this, but there are a lot of other people out there who may not have thought of all the other things that happen behind the scenes inside the foundation um, where we try and help all of our 200 projects out. Um, these are just the obvious services, all right, governance. So the Apache way, we've talked about that many times in the community track this year. Um, mentoring, we have different mentoring programs and community development, a legal shield and fundraising, um, of course, hosting and build pipelines are the Apache infrastructure team and their ponies are doing a great job behind the scenes. Thank you. Um, some things people don't think about until their project gets to be popular are respectability or brand management, right? Apache owns all the trademarks and we, we will register trademarks for projects if they ask. Um, and helping out with having the Apache brand is a huge addition to most projects, uh, just like the Linux Foundation or the Eclipse Foundation. Um, those kind of things are intangible benefits of being in a foundation, but they also take 
organizing, they take work. For uh, any of the legal questions, of course, they take money. That means typically sponsorships. Um, some things that uh, obviously Apache does events, um, community education and management, right? In terms of community management, sometimes we think of that as, as a function of corporations, but we have a community development project here at Apache. Um, other foundations have at least, whether it's an individual or a group, the same kind of things that much like Stormy Peters was mentioning in the earlier talk today, um, ways to help a community understand how to work with the rest of the world or even how to work together to be efficient and collaborating. Um, and one thing that I think we don't think for open source people don't think about as much as marketing and ecosystem development. So if you're a corporate developer, you've probably thought about that. And of course, if you're a marketing person, that's what you do. But a lot of open source projects um, were spread out as a community and we don't necessarily think of that unless one of the volunteers in the community has that kind of skill. Um, and those are important things to help get the word out. Just, just to make sure that people know who you are so they can understand about your project and maybe someday contribute. So how do foundations do all of these things? Well, let's actually start talking about services, sponsors, and funding. Um, obviously, we're all busy, whether it's with our day job or dealing with the world at this point. Um, and most of us have skills around whether it's documentation or testing or code, but many of us don't have the really strong skills in the legal areas or the marketing areas. Or if we do, we may not have the time to contribute in a, in a focused way, right? Reviewing a legal document is not something you can just do quickly. You really need to read it and understand it. So all of these things come from services that we, as foundations, typically will go out and pay someone for. Much like we have the Apache Infra team, because few volunteers want to be paged when the servers or the cloud or anything goes down, we have people to, to do that who work for us, which means we need some money, which means we need some sponsors. So the big question is, where does most of the money come from? It comes from corporate sponsors. In most cases, from sponsorships that are sort of a, an annual or somewhat uh, reviewing renewing thing, where the sponsor gets some recognition and the nonprofit, because of course, these foundations are all nonprofits that we're talking about here, are um, the foundations. So as an example, I'd like to talk about four major software foundations that showcase different kind of, not necessarily funding models, but different ways that they might either use or get funding. And in particular, let's look to see who is doing the funding. So there, remember there are two questions here. One is what do the foundations do and how do they get funding? The other one, as the talk before us at Stormy Peters was talking about, who are the companies who are sponsoring these foundations or open source projects? Um, and why do they do it? Well, that's a tricky question. So let's start off with the Software Freedom Conservancy. So hopefully people have heard of this. Um, you may have, you may have not, may not have. They actually have 45 separate independent projects that um, use them as a sort of corporate home. Um, the Conservancy is a US 501c3 public charity. So they're a nonprofit. And if you as an individual donate money, then um, you can get a tax write off in the US at least. Uh, their projects have independent governance and independent branding. Um, you'll, you'd certainly recognize a few of them. There are plenty that I didn't recognize at first. And in terms of the services they offer, um, they offer legal support, uh, uh, IP stewardship. So of course they will uh, own your trademarks or go to court on your behalf if necessary. Um, they are a fiscal sponsor. So of course you can donate to the conservancy for the benefit of a specific project and they will pass the money along to you. So that, that right there is a huge effort. Um, anybody who's tried to get a bank account in, uh, in, a, in a different state or something or get a bank account in a corporate name knows there's a bunch of paperwork and of course taxes to file and they handle all of that for their member projects. Um, the Conservancy also does a lot of GPL compliance work. So they have done um, both some trade work, trademark work, excuse me, as well as license compliance, whether it's actual court cases or whether it's um, writing about the issue and then uh, using sort of public opinion to force a change in some 
corporation that has been abusing some GPL users. So who sponsors the Conservancy? They've got 45 projects. Some are medium to big, most are smaller. Um, well, they list six major sponsors on their website, uh, which is Google, Linux Australia, Mozilla, Private Internet Access, the company that's been uh, big into uh, internet access, making it more accessible as well as privacy. Red Hat and Josh Triplett, thank you, Josh, um, who are all major sponsors who presumably provide them funding on a regular basis. Um, they don't list their sponsorship levels on the website, but my bet is that the these sponsors provide the bulk of their annual income, as opposed to they also have a listing of individual sponsors uh, who write you know a, a small check or or thankful users whatever. Um, so, how much does Conservancy actually make from their sponsorships or other income, and how much money do they have saved? Well, let's look. Um, in the U.S. and in most jurisdictions. Nonprofits still have to file taxes. Now they don't pay any taxes typically, but they have to file a basic file form, which in the US to the IRS is called the 990 form. So this is an annual filing that sort of lists um, your top level income, your top level expenses, has a very brief breakdown of expenses, um, and then has a number of checks to see, is this nonprofit still meeting their nonprofit goals? Are they still serving the public good or doing education uh, things like that, that the IRS wants to make sure that they're not masquerading as a nonprofit, but really being a profit company. So these are all public figures. Um, they're in IRS filings. They're all public. Many organizations, uh, Conservancy and Apache alike, both publish these 990s on our websites. Um, some other organizations don't. So you have to go to the IRS to find them. That's a, no problem. No big deal. And one thing to note, all these figures are from a couple of years back. Because, of course, many people file their taxes after the year, and many people have an extension for their taxes. And, of course, the IRS takes a while to actually publish the form. So uh, Conservancy's form here is the last one is from 2017. So on the left, we can see their gross income, their total income from sponsorships donations each year, which, while they have a bunch of variability, it averaged about $2 million U.S. per year over the past six years here. And on the right-hand side, we can see the net assets. So the IRS 990 forms, while they're not a full financial picture, they do list total assets and total liabilities, which I calculated here. So as we can see, Conservancy had about a million dollars a year in, in savings, whatever, investments, for a few years. And then the past three years have been saving up some of their money. So in 2017, their total net assets were about $3 million, which on one hand might sound like a lot, on the other hand, as a nonprofit, the only income we typically have is from donations. So when something big happens, like the thing that's happening now, uh, we need a cash cushion to be able to continue our operations, even if our sponsors can't afford or decide not to continue funding us. So this, this makes absolute sense for um, a nonprofit that's doing the kind of great work that Conservancy does. So that's one example. Let's look at ourselves now, and we'll look at the Apache Software Foundation. So as most of us know, we have over 200 uh, community-led projects. Uh, we have a different style of governance, so we expect projects to use the Apache way. Um, and our branding is all tied to Apache, where it's always Apache Lucene or Apache um, IoTDB. Um, we are also a 501c3 public charity. So the services Apache offers, hopefully they're mostly obvious, might not be. Um, we offer infrastructure, so we do a lot of hosting ourselves um, as opposed to Conservancy, which lets their projects do their own thing there. Um, we run conferences. Yay, glad to see everybody here. Uh, we have, as I said earlier, the, the community development project, and we have our diversity and, and inclusion initiative, right? Those are things that help mentoring communities. If you want some help, go on over and ask, because there are people there who want to help out. They just need to know how they can help. And one thing Apache offers uh, is life cycle support. So when you come to Apache, we have the incubator that helps train a community how to work in our way, helps bring in new contributors to grow up your project, and you can graduate to be a regular Apache project. And as we had at our board meeting last month, uh, we 
there are older projects who, you know, the software is still is still used, but nobody's developing new code for it, right? It, it's just there, or there aren't any new bug fixes. So when we don't have enough um, committers to actively maintain a project, we move it to the attic. So the Apache attic will make sure that any code that has ever come to Apache will always be available for the future. Now, of course, in the attic, it's read only, but that's still a resource for the world because of course, users are still using our software 10, 20 years later, even if we're not developing it, developing it anymore. So who sponsors Apache? So here we have, as we list on our website, uh, Apache's eight platinum sponsors. So let's all give a big thanks to Verizon Media, Amazon Web Services, Tencent Cloud, Huawei, Pineapple Fund, Comcast, Facebook, and Google. So um, each of these sponsors pays an annual fee to be listed as a sponsor. Um, in total, this represents about $800,000 of annual donations to the ASF. Uh, at Apache, we, of course, we give them a listing, we, we put them on our materials. Otherwise, they have no say over how projects run, right? This is a purely a financial thing. Um, but again, this list of platinum sponsors provides about half of the annual income for the ASF. And of course, not listed here are our gold, silver, bronze, and other in-kind sponsors who we also thank. And that brings up a really good point. Um, it's not just sponsoring cash, which is important for some things because then the foundation can, as a foundation, we can use this cash wherever we need it uh, in any case now or save it, of course. So one thing that we're not covering in most of this because it's hard to quantify are in-kind sponsorships. So the ASF has seven targeted sponsors, what we call them, who are uh, donating services or other intangibles that we valued at a platinum level. So our targeted platinum sponsors are DLI Piper, which is our law firm, uh, Verizon Media again, Microsoft, Sonotype Nexus, uh, they do a lot of Maven stuff, the OSU Open Source Lab, uh, CloudBees, and JetBrains. So these all donate uh, services to the ASF or to our committers that our projects need. Uh, these are a lot of the build pipelines and things like that, or bandwidths, which of course is big, um, that while we have a value on them, um, it's not cash, but it is a value that our projects need. So that's a that's another thing that's much harder to sort of untangle. Uh, it's not always obvious when you're running a build or getting something from Maven Central that Sonotype Nexus is actually running the Maven Central service on our behalf, um, which is a lot of bandwidth. Um, but the it's not always obvious who's paying for that up front. That's just a thing to think about. So how much does the ASF make? Well, here we can see from, from 2011 to 2017 again, um, the ASF, ASF has an average annual income of, of about 1 million US dollars. Now, 2017 was an unusual year because that was also the year that we booked the Pineapple Fund donation, which was a one-time donation of about a million dollars in Bitcoin, which has since been turned into cash, of course. Um, and on the right, that's on the left, on the right, we can see our cash, our net assets, how much we have in the bank, which has been about a million and a half dollars for a while. And of course, the Pineapple Fund as a one-time donation, we we essentially put in savings. We're not, we don't want to spend that right away because we're not going to get that kind of donation again. We rely on the corporate donors to continue giving year after year. So that's why we saved that one-time donation away. Uh, and in 2017, we ended up with just under $3 million in the bank. So let's switch gears a little bit and we'll talk about the Eclipse Foundation. Now, they list 350, 350 projects. Um, and of course, the size of our project differs. So that have mostly independent governance um, across the, thing, the projects. Various branding, some things that Eclipse use the Eclipse branding, some are, are independent. Uh, they have a lot of shared releases. So everything around their IDE and developer toolings often does a release train, which um, makes it a lot easier for users to sort of consume a package together. Now, the, the big question here that's not obvious is the last line under project overview. Eclipse is a 501c6 business league 
Now that's the IRS terminology here in the US. So that means they're a nonprofit. They don't make a profit. They don't have shareholders, but donations aren't necessarily tax deductible. Essentially, they're a nonprofit that is, they're an organization of different businesses combining to do a shared uh, service or achieve a shared goal of those businesses, not to make profit. But they're not necessarily a public charity as, for example, most of the places in Europe would probably not consider these a charity uh, because they're still working for a business purpose. And thinking about the services Eclipse offers, uh, of course, they offer legal support and they, they have strong IP controls, both on trademarks and on their code, uh, complete infrastructure support. As a developer, as developers who build developer tools, they also have strong development process support. Their release train and they offer ecosystem development support. So when they have different plugins who want to engage with the larger Eclipse community, they have a lot of ways to tie those together. So there are, there are more active services that Eclipse can provide, for example, than the ASF can um, because they have a slightly different model and because it's slightly different, um, you know, sort of technical world that they work in. So who sponsors Eclipse? Well, here we can see the 13 strategic members of Eclipse, um, which is a variety of companies, both obvious software companies and some non-obvious ones. Um, importantly, the Eclipse model has uh, a blend between sponsors just of cash and sponsors who are doing work or taking leadership roles in their projects. So many of these companies not only donate cash to Eclipse, but they also promise to have a certain number of developers work on their project, which of course makes sense. And many of them also participate in Eclipse governance. So some of these organizations essentially um, have seats on various boards at Eclipse, which is part of the relationship they have with their sponsors in, in the strategic level at least. Uh, so that's a diff very different at Eclipse uh, and other 501c6 organizations than uh, Conservancy and the ASF, where our board is completely independent from sponsorship. And just the strategic members of Eclipse, of course, they have supporting members and engineering members and so on. Just the strategic members here uh, provide about $3 million annually to Eclipse for their income, which again, the strategic level is roughly half of their annual income, which is right here. Now we'll note on the left, the um, scale here has changed slightly. So the Eclipse income has been pretty pretty steady at about $4 million a year um, coming in. This is partly because of the technology area they work in, but partly because, again, their funding is tied to their governance, which makes much more stable funding situation. And we also see their net assets um, are were actually negative in 2018, um, which is completely normal. That's merely how they do accounting. The 990 form does not at all show how Eclipse actually does their funding the way we would normally think of as a report. Um, but the key thing is they make about $4 million a year and then uh, provide more services to their projects. So let's look at the big question, the Linux Foundation. Um, about 150 projects, more or a little more than that. Um, governance for the projects is mixed between community-led ones and industry-led ones. Uh, of course, the branding is purely independent for each of their projects. And they are, again, a 501c6 business league, just like Eclipse is. They offer all the standard uh, services. And in fact, they offer much stronger services because um, the Linux Foundation is really an agency model where they have a significant number of employees who are simply service providers for all of their internal projects. So they, I presume, have entire teams for marketing and events and, um, of course, infrastructure and community development, things like that. Um, they ha have clear ecosystem development and they have marketing support um, at a, as a serious level, as we can see from you know watching the industry news, Linux Foundation projects are, are well heard of. And of course, the conference arm. So they run their own conference. They run a lot of conferences for other organizations or for their, their sub projects. So there's a lot more um, happening at the Linux Foundation that the foundation itself is organizing, that their employees are running for their projects directly. Um, so who sponsors the Linux Foundation? Well, that's a complicated question. 
Um, many Linux Foundation projects, or which often sound like foundations that are separate, but are actually part of Linux Foundation, have their own funding models. So this is going to be a kind of complex topic. So who sponsors the foundation, the Linux Foundation itself? Well, these are the 15 platinum corporate members of the Linux Foundation. Now, again, much like Eclipse, essentially each of these platinum sponsors both donates a, a certain amount of money to Linux Foundation each year and has a seat on the board of the Linux Foundation as a whole. So they are directly tied into the governance at the foundation level um, for part of this work. This list represents about $7 million of annual income for the Linux Foundation. So if we look at the CNCF, the Cloud Data Computing Foundation, uh, which is a subsidiary of Linux Foundation, so they're part of Linux Foundation. They have 18 platinum members just for the CNCF who are here. Um, each of them have some sort of role in the CNCF, and each of them donates about $250,000 a year to the CNCF, which of course is really just to the Linux Foundation. So this represents at least $4 million in annual income to the Linux Foundation. So if we look at the Hyperledger Foundation, also a Linux Foundation project, they have 13 premier members. They have different names, that's okay. Um, they of course have smaller levels. Uh, these organizations all have some work to do in Hyperledger. And this list represents about $3 million of annual income for Hyperledger and the Linux Foundation. If we look at the OpenJS Foundation, which has Node.js and a number of other common things, they have four, four platinum members. And we see several names over and over again, of course, here. These platinum sponsors here contribute about $1 million in annual income to the Linux Foundation. So I, I could do that all day, but let's just say it's a complicated question. Who sponsors the Linux Foundation? It's a lot of different companies, and many of them repeatedly. Um, it's not just the software vendors who we see over and over again in the Linux Foundation sponsorship pages for their many, many projects. It's many non-software vendors. It's many IoT vendors who are working on new projects in that space. Um, it's many sort of uh, agency and consulting companies. So it's a really complicated question where all of their funding is coming from. And let's look at the big slide at the end. How much does the Linux Foundation actually make? So if we look on the left, of course, we're seeing annual income again. And let's double check. Yes, the scale on this graph has increased by an order of magnitude. So as we can see from 2011 to 2018, uh, the Linux Foundation's income has been rising in a pretty nice curve there. Um, in 2018, the Linux Foundation made about $96, $96 million US in income. Huh, that's um, a bit more than the rest of us. Okay, they do a lot more, that makes sense. And on the right, we can see their net assets, which again are listed on their 990. So it's not necessarily uh, what a accounting person would look at, but nonetheless uh, shows how much they have in the bank. Again, the chart is an order of magnitude larger. We can see they've had um, about between 20 and 40, 40 million dollars um, in savings, so to speak, uh, in the period 2016 to 2018. Um, so that is a little surprising to me that you would expect they would be using that for their projects. Um, of course, we don't have figures for 2019 because they haven't filed their for forms yet, but it is interesting to see that they have a much, much bigger financial as well as impact footprint in open source compared to many other organizations. So the, the big question here is, um, what does it all mean? And I'm sorry, I don't have that answer yet but I hope this has um, given people something to think about in terms of both the community and the governance and the actual work we do. That's the most important point of any project. Um, but funding and the license and the model of how governance works are also really important um, and often are not something we think about in our day-to-day -day life. So it, this is just a reminder to sort of think about who is the money behind all the different kinds of things. Um, and I see one question, uh, Eclipse is just like the Linux Foundation, right? Um, I would say legally, they're both the same kind of nonprofit, but beyond that, no, they, they, the Eclipse Foundation is much closer to a community led one. It's not community led, but they have a lot of aspects of um, 
including community members and their things. The Linux Foundation is, is primarily uh, industry groups come together, decide what they want governance to be. The people who pay the money make the decision. That's how that group works. That sort of sub foundation like CNCF or whatever. And Eclipse has a lot more um, tactical representation in those in those other areas. Um, so I think we are out of time. Um, I'm happy to sit here for a few minutes and, and answer any other questions. Uh, the slides will be posted. I'll tweet them. And of course, videos will be posted on our the, the Apache Foundation YouTube channel um, in about a week. So looking over at my little chat, uh, any other questions? Oh, hi, Lawrence. That was you. Thanks. Uh, so one quote there is, uh, for still recording, is great talk. I had no idea Apache did so much with relatively so little money. Yes. And thank you for noticing. Um, much like Stormy Peter said in the previous talk to this one, uh, there's still, there's, there's, an, there's a knowledge mismatch between a lot of open source organizations who, foundations who might need money for different things and the corporate uh, people who, who might have funding, right? It's not the engineers who you're working with. It's probably their managers or their manager's managers in some corporation who might have funding. The way they think about when they consider who to sponsor and the way we think about what we might need money for, um, you know, it, it takes a lot of coordination right now. And having people like Stormy and having people like our fundraising team here at Apache, we have a couple awesome people, Daniel and Sally in particular, uh, to sort of, let us understand how we should approach saying, hey, Apache wants to have more conferences next year. Do you want to help pay for it? Well, what's what's it to the company and when do companies have money? So another question, <laughs> another question is, what would be an example of an important decision that was taken at the ASF, which could be taken because it is a community of individuals and not of corporations? Uh, okay, I think the best way to answer that would be as a non-answer, given that I think there are a lot of decisions we don't have to make because we're not beholden to any of our sponsors or to other market pressures. Um, I think there are a lot of cases where, I, I'd have, it'd be hard to find a solid example, but a lot of cases where independent projects or other smaller organizations had to change something um, or had to, or, or, or essentially ended up getting uh, forked and then overshadowed by someone else because they weren't independent. And Apache, uh, both at the board level and, and we certainly hope at the project level, um, it doesn't matter what marketing is trying to do or what you know some um, overly strong corporation, let's say, just to be polite, uh, is trying to bully about something uh, Apache has the resources in terms of the community and our structure to fend that off. And we've actually, we, we've had some questions in the past, not necessarily public, where uh, there are clear signs of corporations either trying to influence uh, brands and trademarks or communities and technology where, you know, the board has the ability to get into that community and say, no, that's not okay. We need the rest of the community to help take over. Um, and if not, then, you know, we have, in some cases, removed people from PMCs if they're not acting on behalf of the project. So in terms of making a decision, um, I think it's mostly that we, we free communities of individuals to make their own decisions um, immaterial of outside factors like sponsorship or funding or, you know, big company marketing campaigns. Um, I hope that makes sense. And I think we are well over time. So good, you're welcome. And uh, I would like to let our recording team uh, free up for the next talk. So I will say goodbye. I will go tweet a link to my slides and uh, hope to hear questions about um, these numbers and what it means later on, because there's, there's a lot more to explore here. And very few of us are financial uh, experts or accountants. So it's not always easy to see what the important sides are, whether it's knowing which organizations, which which companies are sponsoring who, or whether it's, as Stormy was saying earlier, 
what our organizations need money for, we can't do with our own effort. Uh, and then how do we go go about that? And that's there's a lot to explore there. And uh, I'm hoping to work on that in another new website soon. So stay tuned and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. Bye. Oh, I should do this, huh?